Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 NO Power Minority Business Conference. My name is Jamal Smith. I am currently the Director for Strategic Partnerships and Government Affairs at IU Health. And today I'm joined by Vincent Ash and Kelly Doucette to talk to you about the process and the journey of becoming a black professional here in Indianapolis. According to a 2019 study by the Center for Talent Innovation, corporate America's efforts to increase diversity are inadequate. Many college-educated black Americans enter corporate America with dreams, ready to do great things, but they're confronted with an unwelcome culture. Our panel today will discuss navigating that career as a black professional in Indianapolis. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Doucette, Regional Community Partnership Specialist at Meyer, and Vincent Ash, Vice President of Development for Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Vincent, Kelly, welcome. Thank you Thanks for, for having, having us. Me. All right. So we're going to jump right into this thing, um, becoming a or navigating the arena of becoming a black professional here in Indianapolis. It's more than a notion, uh, and a number of people obviously have sought out to become professionals, um, but not everybody succeeds. You guys have obviously been successful, and one of the purposes we have here is for you to share that knowledge with you know, our, our general community. So uh, let's start with a personal reflection uh, on your growth profession. And uh, just in short, how would you describe your journey to get to where you are now? Vincent, I'll start with you. Yeah, so um, again, thank you for having me, Jamal. Um, Vincent Ash, VP of Development um, for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Um, have been there for just shy of uh, eight months. Um, I started off my career uh, in real estate development, uh, kind of working for uh, a corporate developer. That's pretty recognized here uh, in Indianapolis. Um, and, and kind of got to the point where, um, a, as an analyst for them, I was ready for just something a little bit different, something a little bit more. Um, and I've always been um, the one not to shy away from challenges, consider challenges more as opportunities to be creative or be able to problem solve. Um, you know, you have the notion that, you know, you know, diamonds are created by pressure and the only way you can continue to grow is if you continue to challenge yourself whether that is continuing education uh taking on addition additional responsibilities in, in the role you're at um, or just gathering you know different perspectives from people that can push you um, so i was at the point uh kind of in my career where I, I was ready to move on and knew i wanted to be uh, more as a, a developer myself and working in real estate uh, development um, you could call myself young and, and bullish at the time but um, there was a role open at my company I was at, and the COO told me, he said, hey, you have to go, normally you have to go this position, this position before you're ready to go. Um, in the back of my head, I'm like, I've been here for four years. There's no way I'm waiting another. I've never seen a position open in the, either one of those uh, departments. There's no way I'm waiting another 10 years to actually get to do what I uh, want to do. So ultimately, uh, I began kind of um, my search for a, a new role. Um, again, ultimately thinking I was going to go work for another real estate developer and kind of get out of the analyst role. Um, and actually ended up at the Indy Chamber um, and helped run the economic development team uh, for the city of Indianapolis. Um, went through a plethora of interviews. Um, again, I was very uh, picky uh, about mm -hmm. what I wanted. Um, went through a process of eight months, turned down jobs, was very candid during the interviews of, uh, you know, telling the hiring manager, this, these are my goals, can you help me get there? Um, if not, this is really, I don't feel like this is gonna be a, a good fit. Again, me being young and naive and a little bullish. Um, again, I landed at the uh, Indy Chamber um, and, and took that offer over others, um, more so because I felt like it was an opportunity to, to leverage those connections and networks that yeah. has ultimately benefited uh, my career so far. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how I have navigated, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. being in Indianapolis was more, more so creating that network um, and leveraging you know, relationships or platforms that certain organizations kind of have, you know, uh, within Indianapolis. I mean, and being a kid, grew up here um, in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. couldn't mm -hmm. even tell you what the Indy Chamber was when I was growing up, or <laughs> if I even care for that matter. Um, but to be kind of exposed to kind of a different element, a lot of things that's going on throughout the city. Um, I used to constantly read IBJ articles of different announcements. I'm like, that sounds fun, I wanna do that. And uh, ultimately, uh, end up being a part of Putting together um, some real estate development deals and yeah. bringing companies to Indianapolis, so yeah. it's been fun. That's pretty slick. I, and you yeah. mentioned uh, one of the things that stuck out is uh, 
uh, what, what some, especially some of our, our elder brethren, yeah. would consider impatience. Yeah. And I think we need to dive in that, uh, into that a little bit. But Kelly, won't you give our audience a little bit of a background and some context about how you navigated to get to where you are? A little dissimilar from from Vincent, right? As you know, statewide, Meyer is 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 a is a national brand, right? So, so so let us in a little bit backstage into how you got to where you are. Sure, um, my story is uh, almost completely opposite from mm -hmm. Vincent. Uh, my career path has not been linear in any way, uh, shape, or form. Uh, I have a degree in hospitality, and I work in community uh, organizations. So. Um, I've been in Indianapolis uh, probably about four and a half years now, and I came to Indy on purpose mm -hmm. um, with say a that job. Again. Say that again. I did, and I say it, I say it proudly. Yeah, I came absolutely. to Indianapolis on purpose um, because uh, I lived in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm from Fort Wayne, and um, a lot of my people, or my circle, are from Indianapolis, yeah. and so it's been it's been a good city to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started out in um, adult day services. I have worked um, in nonprofit. And so um, when the opportunity presented itself for Meyer, um, it was a little um, nerve wracking because it's a brand new position. And so um, I'm basically building it from scratch. But what I've learned is that my networking here in Indianapolis mm -hmm. um, and really throughout the state um, has been beneficial to this role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I, you know, I tell people all the time, I d still am not 100% sure what I want to be when I grow up. Nice. Um, and so Indianapolis is a great place to kind of figure that out. It's small enough where, um, you know, you can navigate and you can find people that you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's large enough where there is no lack of opportunity if that's actually what you want. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the work that I do now, um, again, like I said, we're building a role. So it's based on um, Myers and actually only in six states. So we are not more national. More regional. We sort of more regional Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, I started to say regional. I mean, I would have agreed with you. With that, <laughs> Aspirationally <yeah. laughs> national. How about that? Um, and so um, I cover 42 stores between Kentucky and Indiana. Okay. And so um, when they were looking at creating this role, it was more so how do we find someone that can really localize our community efforts. Mm -hmm. um, Meyer is a very humble company and a lot of folks don't know all of the amazing work that they do in the community. Um, and I'm not necessarily here to share all of those things, but yeah. it is an opportunity to highlight some of the really cool things that we do locally mm -hmm. um, and also have kind of a boots on the ground effort as to um, you know, how do we dive in a little bit deeper yeah. into the communities that we do serve. And so um, I get to do that on a regular basis. I get to tap into my network. I get to know, talk to the people that I know. Yeah. Um, I tell folks all the time, I kind of collect people along my life journey. And so yeah. this is an opportunity for those that are doing good work um, to be highlighted, to, you know, find out ways that we can potentially partner with them. Mm -hmm. um, and Indianapolis has been a really great place for me to build the position so that I can kind of um, create pathways and, and understanding of how to move what we do yeah. to our Fort Wayne market, to yeah. our, you know, Louisville area. Um, and I imagine that allows you to make some mistakes along the way too, which is it does. Mm -hmm, uh, my is background is in uh, nonprofit, and mm -hmm. so um, what I've learned is going from nonprofit to corporate is that there's a whole lot of extra processes <laughs> um, and legal yeah, that uh, you know you don't you really have to legal. go through a whole lot. Um, yeah. But it is a learning process, and it and to your point about being impatient, mm -hmm. um, it has been a, a huge learning lesson to be patient. Mm -hmm. um, because I can't just get a straight answer yep. right away. I have to go through an oh. entire list of people, um, which is fine because then it covers all parties involved. However, um, it can it can be tedious at times. Let's, I want to dive into that too because if you think about it, especially when you're doing what you know you're doing work that you're passionate about, mm -hmm. um, and doubly if the work that you're doing either supports or and or impacts the greater public, mm -hmm. um, patience is something that. I, I find a little, little interesting in, in some of those spaces. But um, a couple of key themes that I heard in, 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 as you were kind of unfolding your journey um, was one, right, how important your network has been. 
um, considering being from Fort Wayne, having spent some time in Chicago, and how the network in Indy has allowed or afforded you, mm -hmm. right, to be successful at your in your current position. And then another thing that stuck out was uh, when you called Meyer a humble company, um, and you and you did so with a smile, which means. I'm assuming you enjoy, at least thus far, working for Meyer, which is yeah. which is you know not something everyone can speak to. A lot of folks aspire to be professionals and aspire for opportunities and professions um, that you know they may be passionate about more of the position than they are the company for which they work. Right. So it's 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 a blessing to be able to be in the same space and do both. Yeah. Circling back on that impatience, though, right? So what, like, because I think that's 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 real. Yeah. Long gone are the days when any, if many or any of us are staying on a job for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, right? right. Um, in fact, some of our parents or grandparents would call us foolish for moving as quickly and as fast as we yeah. do, right? Mm -hmm. How would you guys, you know, without any statistical data, what, what would you say as you give an advice to, let's say, some up and coming young professionals who are thinking about, similar to your, um, your journey, Vincent, I might have an opportunity that's in front of me, but I just got to this position. What advice would you give them about whether they should or should not be patient in, in a moment like that? Yeah, so um, that's a good question, Jamal. And I think mostly it depends on um, I guess you got to outweigh the pros and cons. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of pride myself on being able to, to be a mentor. I feel like it's our responsibility, mm -hmm. um, you know, as black and brown professionals to upbring and uplift others uh, in the community and be able to um, provide sound advice. Um, and so in that instance, I've had many conversations actually like this before, like just previously, like this past week. Um, where uh, again you have to outweigh the pros and cons so um yes you just got this opportunity what does this next opportunity look like mm -hmm. um where's your passion at where mm -hmm. which one is going you're going to find the most fulfillment at mm -hmm. um and which one do you ultimately think is going to um you're going to be able to utilize the most to get to your end goal mm -hmm. um because i think most people don't necessarily take a position thinking hey i'm going to be here um for the rest of my life like this is what i want to do um all, most of the time, uh, the majority of people um, have end goals to say, hey, I want to own my own company or I want to do this um, eventually. Um, this is the, I want to be a, the CEO or COO at a C-level C position. Um, so really thinking through, okay, so out of those um, you know, opportunities, um, which one do you think you can be able to utilize to get that? Is it utilizing the platform? Yeah that that organization may be able to bring, the network that that organization may be able to bring a company, um, or is it a, just an experience thing where, like, hey, you really, you probably really need to hone in on this skill. Um, this position is going to allow you to go do that a little bit more. That's, a, yeah. that, that's an interesting way of putting that. So, I, you know, it's funny when you have the discussions with folks who have been there, done that, right? Yeah. Some of my, mm -hmm. you know, older mentors, and they speak about, you know, the readiness of it. Mm -hmm. so, so there's this notion that, you know, maybe our generation and in particular generations after us are impatient and yeah. not willing to put in the work it takes to acquire the skill set or the knowledge necessary to be successful at whatever that position is. Yeah. Kelly, speak to that balance of, of one, to Vincent's point, right? Knowing what you want mm -hmm. and, and needing to go and, and grab it versus being legitimately ready to do so? Um, I think, you know, it's certainly generational, mm -hmm. um, but I think we also get caught up sometimes in title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, when, you know, to Vincent's point, I firmly believe that when he saw that position, that his skill set matched the job description, right? Right, yeah. Um, and so I think we get caught up in what could be or mm -hmm. what we want to show the world mm -hmm. as opposed to what we're actually ready for. And ready is subjective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, facts. I think I think Hashtag we also have facts. to, I think so. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think you can be ready in some areas, but I think yeah. that we also get caught up in having to feel like we have to check every box I was gonna say, do, of do every you, job description. Do you or 
or are you ever really 100% ready? I don't think you should be. And I mm. think that if you are 100% ready, then mm. you need to step above whatever that next yeah. position is. It's that comfortability Correct. point there. Mm. Correct. So I think, yeah. I think you know, our generation can be a little impatient because I think we all some, sometimes feel like we have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think that there are some key, you know, skill sets that we, that take time to really um, understand and learn and get good at yeah. that we try to shortcut. Mm. And um, depending on the position, that shortcut could be detrimental to your entire career. Yeah. You yeah. could make a mistake that yeah. um, could really put you on the back burner to Can't any potential job, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think I'm going to always go back to your network. Um, you know, at my, you know, we call it our circle of trust. Yeah. You have to have people that will be honest with you and tell you, um, you know what? Yeah. You're, you know, a manager right now I'm not a hundred percent sure that that CEO role is yeah. for you yeah. um, but let's figure out you know what you need to do in to the meantime there. to get there right. yeah. and some of the things can be shortcutted right like our generation figures it out technology definitely has Absolutely. helped with that Absolutely. Um, but I think that um, beyond the shortcut I think there's also maturity that comes mm -hmm. with you know leading people and that is not something that mm. I do believe that you can shortcut. I think it's something that you that is definitely set. have to learn and to yeah. listen um, along the way. Yeah. So um, I am a huge advocate of this city. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, don't only think that you can only do things that only, you know, you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Um, what they say? Learn to be comfortable. Learn to, there's so much in art and sports and whatnot. So yeah. that would be my, my advice. All right, so Vincent, I'll throw it to you as well. Uh, if you were giving or imparting some wisdom on some young professionals yeah. trying to figure it out, and we spoke about a lot of the great things, what is the, uh, what is your don't do moment? Um, yeah, don't be afraid to take a risk. Um, I actually agree uh, with Kelly's sentiment. Um, when I was in college, kind of finishing up my uh, undergrad, um, I worked for the Parks Department. I knew that's what I didn't want to do long term left that job to take an internship, mm -hmm. less pay, uh, but more of experience of what I wanted to do long term. Yeah. Ultimately, it did pay off, but it was a risk, uh, not only you know for myself, but for my family. I had a daughter at the time um, and was raising her. So um, don't be afraid to take risk. Uh, again, and also don't be afraid to expand your network out of the norm um, as well. Uh, you know. There's a variety of different perspectives, um, you know, in the city and different organizations that have different perspectives. Feel free to like tap into different people that you feel like you can make a genuine relationship with. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times people try to box somebody out because they belong to, you know, this political party or that political party or this organization that I really don't agree with what they're doing. But um, you can have a genuine connection with that person and they can actually really sew into your life. So I would say don't be afraid um, to tap outside your your normal, your norm network um, that you're used to going with. That's dope. Yep. Miss and Ash, yep. Kelly Doucette, thank you guys. My, my takeaway moment, honestly, and the, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily a don't do, but or a to do is self-reflection. I think is extremely important. I think it's a mature exercise yeah. that a lot of folks don't take part in. The reason I think it's so important is um, as you're thinking about what your journey is and the things that you want to do, you should definitely know what you are not good at yep. <laughs> and be honest with yourself. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't get good at them, yeah. Yeah. but you'll never get good at something you're not willing to work at, mm -hmm. right? I think that's the athlete in me, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I want to be the best jump shooter you know, uh, in, in, the, in the game and I never practice at it, yeah. then I'll never become it, right? right. So self-reflection is key. Really being, uh, having a keen understanding about where you truly fit mm -hmm. in the journey of where you want to become, I think is important. Again, we thank you guys for being here and sharing your time. We thank everybody for tuning in. Again, we welcome you to the 2022 NO Power uh, Minority Business Conference, and we hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the show. Thank you. The events of summer 2020 highlighted longstanding inequalities, particularly among the Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities that has had a significant impact on our country. 
At J.P. Morgan Chase, a key goal is to help break down systemic barriers that have created profound disparities. That's why we committed $30 billion towards racial equity to provide resources and opportunity for our Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities. We are focused on the main drivers of wealth, including home ownership and small business ownership. Our commitment includes helping an additional 40,000 households become homeowners and lowering mortgage payments through refinance for 20,000 more with the help of our community home lending advisors and managers. For us to be able to create home ownership opportunities for people that haven't had exposure in the past, it speaks to the needs of the community and it's just something that I felt very happy to be a part of it. We are also financing the creation and preservation of 100,000 affordable rental units. And we've developed a program to incentivize landlords to maintain affordable rents. To support entrepreneurship, we're providing an additional 15,000 loans to small businesses, as well as one-on-one -on -one mentorship and support through our senior business consultants. Everyone is looking for the same information. Where do I go and how can I get started? The end goal is the same. How can we help educate and bring awareness to what we're doing as a firm and most importantly, make a true impact within their homes and or communities? Action. We're also increasing our spending with diverse suppliers. We're making banking more affordable for people through access to low cost accounts and adding branches in traditionally underserved neighborhoods, building community centers in neighborhoods that need it the most, and hiring community managers to help our customers along the way. In order for us to be successful in these communities, we will need everyone leading the charge. Home lending, small business, wealth management, we all need to get in front of our customers, get in front of the community and help them. As we continue supporting diverse local businesses and nonprofits, we've established a new initiative using new markets tax credit investments to spur growth and inclusion. We've invested more than $100 million in minority-owned banks across the country and are building a more equitable and representative workforce by developing a diverse talent pipeline for people at all career levels. We're committed to racial equity and helping drive inclusive growth in communities for a stronger and sustainable economy for all. Well, hello and welcome to InnoPower. My name is Tamara Cypress. I'm a CSR consultant with Black Onyx Management and I'm incredibly excited to serve as your moderator today. I am joined by a dynamic duo with JP Morgan Chase, who's gonna help us dig into a critical topic around closing the racial wealth gap. Before I have them introduce themselves, let me level set how we're gonna spend our time today. One, we wanna really help define what is generational wealth. Two, we're going to dig into some of those gaps and barriers that they're seeing. And then three, we're going to have them talk about how do you engage with the bank so that you can feel closer to them. So with that, I'm going to start with John. How about you introduce yourself? And instead of just telling us your title, tell us what do you do at the bank? Again, my name is John. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a market director of wealth um, for Western Indiana. What I do is I serve my advisors by helping them create a culture in order to build their book of business. I always like to say, give them their perfect career. And if you talk to my advisors, it's all about helping people, adding people to their book of business, and then the relationships that they already have, deepening those. Awesome, and before I move to Aaron, who's gonna win the playoffs this year? It's not gonna be the Pacers. 317, born and raised. Just want to put that out there. We have a very great draft pick, Jay Nivey, come home. But I'm going to say it is Golden State. Tested, experienced. They got Steph Curry. Threes, I'm really good at math. They're better than twos, and they hit a lot of those. And uh, bring it back to the bed. So this is recorded, no pressure. <laughs> Aaron? Hi, um, I'm Erin Shaw, and I run the private bank here in Indiana and in Louisville, Kentucky. And what we do for clients is we help successful families with complex balance sheets across both sides of the balance sheet. So from lending, banking, investing, um, but it all starts with a plan. And um, yep. And did you want to play? No, because play? I didn't even know the playoffs were going on. Um, I think I did. 
share with you that I did finish watching Winning Time, but that was the 70s and 80s, so I don't think I am an expert and can weigh in. But you miss, do you miss the 80s? I do miss the 80s, actually. I love the 80s. We could talk about that forever. I was born in the 80s. It's <laughs> We also have the right people to talk about generational wealth. So let's start digging into it. And I want to give you a recent study with consumer finances, which is referenced on the Federal Reserve. And it shared longstanding and substantial wealth disparities between families in different racial and ethnic groups. So very little change over the years. Mm. What that means is the typical white family has eight times the wealth of a black family. And they have five times the wealth of a Hispanic family. Those are huge mm. and significant changes or differences. As we start to think about generational wealth, I'm gonna start with you, Erin. Okay. What is it and why is it so important? So generational wealth, like how we typically think of it, are assets that are passed down um, to children, grandchildren, and you, know, you can think about investments, so stocks and bonds, maybe property, but also businesses, so we see that a lot. Um, but I also think of it in different terms of, you know, maybe, you know, we were sharing stories earlier and I was telling you how my parents were first generation going to college and that was really important to them. And so they put themselves, they work, put themselves through school. Um, and that was very important to share the, when I was going to college, that they were able to provide um, for me to go to school and not have any student loan debt. So it's not necessarily always passing wealth down, but it might also be passing down, you know, your philosophy, your values, things like that. Um, so there's generational wealth that happens that way as well. And we can't underscore the importance of having your education paid. Mm. I feel like I'm a split, so I had partial undergrad Same. paid, um, but I was very privileged to have my corporation pay 100% of my grad school. So not seeing that invoice made a huge difference in my 20s. Right, absolutely. Do you want to dig into generational wealth? Generational wealth is, I would say, the reason why I'm in this business. Um, my dad is a second, well, my dad isn't a financial advisor, which makes me yep. a second generation financial advisor. Um, and I'm a huge quote person. I, hopefully I don't butcher this, but one of my favorite quotes is, it's not how much money you make, it's how much you keep. Yep. It is how hard you have your money work for you and then how many generations you can impact. Um, that being said, and going back to my father, who is one of my best friends and a mentor, it's neither of his parents graduated from middle school. Mm. He's from South Carolina grew up in a trailer home that had a dirt road probably until 10, 15 years ago. Generational wealth for my grandparents was giving the 10 siblings their house. Then you go from that and what he has taught me and the resources that him and my mom sacrificed in order for me to have access to, then it turns into life insurance. You know, in order for God willing one day when I have a family and they've got grandkids in order to be mm -hmm. able to financially give options and freedom and then putting it on me in order to take it to the next step, which is because of education, because of resources, then you put investments in there. You, you add everything before the house, the insurance. Now it's estate planning. Now it's wills. Now it's trust. And then it's going to be on me in order to pass not only the education and the experience, but hopefully my kids will take it to the next level. Yeah. To me, that's generational wealth. I love that. So I'm gonna have you just say a little bit more and dig into what are some of those best practices to become financially independent? So I am an only child, so this is gonna sound <laughs> selfish. Um, pay yourself first. That is the first thing I think of is pay yourself first. Now, tithe, but what I see is that we pay everybody else and then we save and we invest what's left. Let's pay ourselves first, and then the luxuries come you know, after that. That's the first thing I would tell anyone. And that's a hard lesson probably. You see a lot of people come to your bank. Is that a hard conversation to have with people? We're a culture of consumers. We're not a culture of savers. Um, I'm on Instagram, and it gets me every day. <laughs> I have a new package that comes through because I see something so quick in order to get it. One of the things that my dad and my family has told me, though, is you automate this. You make it as easy as possible. Like Aaron was saying, yep. with leading, with planning, 
is I know exactly the percentage that I need to save mm -hmm. in order for me to reach my goals. You do that first. And then I like to joke that I kind of do live paycheck to paycheck because every two weeks, that's the amount of money that I then can spend on Jordans or <laughs> tickets or spoiling my girlfriend, whatever it is. But if I don't take care of myself first, my future self isn't going to be in as good of a spot. Spot on. So I'm going to have you dig in a little bit more. Give us some more basics. So pay yourself first. Um, sounds simple, but make it plain for people that are just still wrapping their brain around this generational wealth. What are some basics that people or even companies can begin with? Well, I was thinking about that too. That was something absolutely the pay yourself first, but also, I mean, you kind of have to start as, you know, and I know we're talking to people across like the whole wealth spectrum, but just even right now, like establishing an emergency fund. I know it seems so basic, but the fact that they're just, you know, there's big expenses that come up. Something happens with your car, your home, your kids. I mean, I just, you know, my son broke his arm um, a couple weeks ago, so we got to hit our out-of-pocket maximum again. <laughs> and so there's so many things that come up where it's just like, if you don't have that reserve fund in place, it can derail your whole plan that you've set up. Um, so I would absolutely say, make sure you have uh, your emergency fund in place. And, you know, savings really a muscle, like to your point. Uh, and the more that you do it, um, then it's just something that becomes a behavior. So that was something. And then you, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with paying yourself first, but not living beyond your means. You said the culture. Absolutely. I can tell you what I bought from Instagram ads, you know, sunglasses, things like that. You're scrolling through, you're like, oh, I really need that. And I think it goes back to the needs versus wants. And I just remember so many times growing up, um, I thought I needed something and it was always, you may think you need it, but you want it. And so I, you know, getting that in, maybe that's something that you need to set up a separate savings account, a separate checking account and have funds go over there so that you can, you have to delay gratification, but then you can pay cash for it. Um, so I think of that, at, you know, or some other additional things. Can have you your back off of that. And I know we don't do a lot of insurance. We are investment people. Right. But I think protection. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about the emergency fund, it's in order to protect your other investments. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, especially in the market right now, sell at a bad time when things are down in yep. order to take care of things. I love to ask people what they think their most valuable asset is. And they want to say their house. They want to say their car. Maybe someone has a purse collection. <laughs> but it's actually us and our ability to earn income. Yeah, your health. You know, think about mm -hmm. your income and multiply it by hopefully I live another 50 years. I don't have anything in my life that would be of that value. What are we doing in order to protect that? Because we can have all these plans of if we live a long, healthy life. But what if we don't? Right. I mean, there's people that depend on that income whether it's kids, whether it's spouses, whether it's my cousin, or because I'm an only child and I'm a mom's boy, it's my mom, you know? I still want them to have everything that we planned, whether I'm here or not. Yep. I love that. I thought you were gonna go with health as wealth, and that's really where we were supposed to start first, <laughs> so I like that. And by the way, only children are not spoiled. We have the hardest burden Ever because we have to take care of our parents all by ourselves uh, and the oldest. I'm gonna say I'm spoiled. I'm just not right. You're not making. <laughs> this. I'm gonna say. It. So let's pivot a little bit. We've defined what generational wealth is. We obviously understand it's very important whether we're thinking about paying ourselves first or these emergency funds. Even if you don't have a kid that's going to break something, we're living in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Understanding wealth is incredibly important. Let's talk about some of those barriers. So there's a recent study that shares that over 50% of black businesses are unbanked or underbanked. As a financial institution, you have to be looking at some of these disparities to help you make some better solutions for us. Mm -hmm. Understanding these disparities also help us go to root causes versus just the symptoms. As we think about some of these gaps, Aaron, I'll start with you. Dig into some of the pitfalls that you're seeing when people are really trying to 
really build their wealth. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about too was just watching your debt. Um, you know, it's one of those things that it's very easy where it can creep up and paying interest becomes very normalized. Mm -hmm. So when I think of certain debts, you know, if you are to get a home um, and then you have mortgage interest or you, you know, invested in yourself and now you have student loan interest, that's a little different, obviously, than credit card debt. So those are some things where I see where then it can affect your credit score and, you know, it becomes comes, you know, unfortunately, that's so much harder to dig out of when you, you know, things that you never thought maybe would affect your credit score can. And then to your point about, okay, now we need, you know, it's time to get a loan. And maybe there's things that have happened that you could have had hopefully some, um, you know, more control over if you watch, if you watch where you're getting or where you're um, getting your debt from. So you mentioned the lower credit score. I mean, unfortunately, the black community and communities of color are dealing with that. How is Chase really supporting some of the people that walk through your doors that have lower credit scores? It's called credit journey. Yeah. It is one of the things where I probably take it for granted, um, but we have a resource that helps you complimentary free track your credit because like Aaron was saying mm -hmm. this is something very basic that we all know about but we don't understand the impacts that it could have you're buying a car maybe right. you're not getting 1.9 you're getting three you're getting five and it takes cash flow out of your home um buying a mortgage or getting a mortgage right now and things like that um essentially it's taking food out of people's mouths so i love credit journey it's on chase.com and that's not just a plug, yeah. <laughs> but it's complimentary. We can sign you up and it will break down every single thing of what is affecting your credit score. It will give you ideas of what to do in order to increase it. When you're going over a certain debt limit on a certain card, it notifies you. It's also great for identity theft because nowadays when people are using your card in your name and you don't know, it gives you an alert. That small thing right there to keep it top of mind mm -hmm. in order to give you strategies and options in order to be in a better spot is one of the many ways that we are trying to reach everyone where they are in order for, again, their future self to be better than where they are now. I love that. And I wanted to touch that credit score because I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, Aaron, I'm going to have you dig in a little bit more as we talk about the pitfalls. Your team shared that one of them could be not having succession planning. Mm -hmm. For those that don't understand that, what is succession planning? Why is it important? I mean, I think of succession planning as if you have a business, I mean, business, family, but it's something that you communicate and that is written down and that's documented. I mean, I think so many times I've seen multiple business owners that have a desire to um, give it to either a certain, you know, employee, ch you know, child, something like that, but it's not written down. And that's, you know, unfortunately, if when someone passes and they don't know exactly your wishes, your intent for what's to happen with that business, you know, unfortunately dies with that person if you, if you don't have it clearly written out. Um, and and it also, there's so many businesses that the family works. And, you know, I was sharing with you earlier, I just had lunch with someone and he's second generation and his father started the business with um, nine employees and now he has 400 and just the pride that comes with that. His dad's still involved, but he's just as so, he was sharing, you know, how proud his father is of all he's done, but there's also nine siblings. And so making sure that they have a, you know, a well-written succession plan, you can add insurance of course, to a key person insurance, but it's also, you have to make sure that it's communicated and that it's written down because you work so hard um, for what, you know, what you're building. And so you want to make sure it, you know, the legacy continues. To piggyback off of that, yeah. the state has a succession plan for Yes, you. they do. Everyone has and a will. It, yes. <laughs> it probably isn't going to divide your assets right. how you want it to. Let's take control. It's almost like pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. I am a control freak when it comes to my money. I know exactly where I want it to go, who I want it to go. And it's to, written down. And it's written down. And in a legal document. In a legal document. Okay. We had a family meeting, so everybody mm -hmm. knows what their yep. roles are. But being an only child and being a mama's boy, <laughs> if I didn't have that process and those resources, yep. I can only imagine if my mom had to bury me 
and have to go through all this stuff. Right. That is not a legacy that I want to leave. And let's be honest, hey, when you die and you got money, right. people come out yeah. the woodwork. <laughs> yes, they <laughs> They come out the woodwork. So if you right. don't have that documented and someone that's responsible, yeah. you have no idea from the grave where it's going to go. I love the institutions that I think have raised me and made me who I am and I want to give back. But I can tell you, if I had a sibling, are they going to part with those funds because they mm -hmm. might not have the same passion about that stuff? So you want to have it written down. Yeah. Create a rule book for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Those are great tips. It sounds like your roles are very relationship based. And when it comes to banking or any relationship, you have to have trust. Mm. I'm going to bring John back into this conversation. Can you talk about some of your experiences in this space and why trusting your institution or people who work in the bank are so is so important? So I'm going to throw some stats out to you. Right now, I think the black population is about 13 percent, um, about 4 percent when it comes to financial advisors. When I was an intern for my father in high school, he was the only one in his firm. I always love to identify progress, even though it's not perfection, of, you know, now on my team, it's 25%, you know, and Aaron has a very diverse team. When you're getting information, I think the relationship and trust is huge. Going back to my grandparents in South Carolina, that was a different time. You know, when I was going down there for the summer, they were taking me to Charleston, and we were going to, like, the markets that, you know, like, the slaves were sold on. When you're talking about banking, unfortunately, there isn't the best relationship because of predatory lending. When you're talking about healthcare, you've got Tuskegee. If you don't have a relationship, you're never gonna trust the information that you're getting. So one of the biggest things for us is with our clients, we need to know about their family, we need to know about their occupation, what their hobbies are, what mm -hmm. keeps them up at night, the things they like to do for fun. in their goals. I like to say it puts meat on the bones a little bit, like it brings some color to it. It gets you emotionally charged. Going back to what you were saying, if I walked into an institution and there was no one that looked like me, how much trust am I going to have that that organization reflects my character, my morals, and my thoughts? And to be honest, I can probably relate in a lot of circumstances with another African-American than someone else can. I know when I got hurt when I was young, my grandma told me to put some dirt on, right? <laughs> Not because dirt was going to make me feel better, but there's no way she was gonna send me to a doctor. Right. When they were talking about money that they saved, they were putting it in a mattress because they were scared of what they didn't know. Now I can see my dad and how he is with his siblings of spreading out that information. And now me and my cousins, them having a resource of us growing up together, having the same background, going through the same things, the information that I give them, they know is coming from a certain place. They know about the mistakes that I've made. It's not as though you're on your high horse and you're telling them what to do. It's literally out of love, you know? And I personally think take care of my family, my community first, before I want to take care of strangers. And can I also say, like, when I think of an institution, uh, you know, obviously you want to go with a reputable one, and we can talk all day long. There's a reason why we both work at J.P. Morgan Chase. But then also it's when you get to know somebody in the branch or on our team, and they say, yes, I, you know, I bank at Chase, but I know Jonathan. Like, I know him personally. And relationships anymore, like you were saying, it's so important. I mean, I think about where we get all of our advice. I, I was watching the Super Bowl mainly for the halftime show because uh, it's all my favorite music, but but also it was amazing. But um, I think about how many crypto, I could not believe how many crypto commercials there were. And I thought to myself, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, it's down 50%. We were talking about Instagram ads. You think about how much stuff is thrown at you. You need to be able to go to someone that you trust, that you have a relationship with, that you can say, I just saw this. I just heard this on the news. How does that fit within my plan? Jonathan, what do you think about this for my situation? And that's why you need to build a relationship with a professional because they can help 
you know, quiet the noise down and they're focused on you. Cut through the entertainment. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things that people forget. Like yeah. people on TV and Instagram, yeah. they're looking for viewers. On Instagram, you're looking for followers. So the things that are going to disturb you get people to come back, but it's not based off of fact. Group text is a gift and a curse. Yeah. yeah. I've got a group text of my friends. When the market was up, we weren't talking about anything <laughs> other than the game tonight. Oh, but right now, right. when they have to look at certain statements, they want to know what we're talking about, what we're doing, the things expert. like that. Exactly. I am the expert. And I am the expert, I will say, even though they don't work with me. They just want my free advice. Yes. That's why I tell them to go into a branch and get a plan, yep. because the only advice I'm giving them right now is you need to talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But I think we need to put it to their situation. What's important to you is different than what's important to me. Right. The baggage that I might have with money is going to be different mm -hmm. than your experience. Mm -hmm. Every plan isn't created the same, and we all don't think the same. I don't know what that is unless I have a relationship with you. And I think that's the biggest thing of not having it as a transaction and it all about the revenue and how much money I'm going to make and how much money do you have, but it's the impact. And again, like how many generations and how hard it can work, but we have to have the relationship. And when I think I hear what I'm saying, what you guys are saying, relationships and trust, it's really not about the institution, it's about people. Mm -hmm. And I know that people are what builds this trust that's mm -hmm. earned. And I also know that your organization in Indiana has close to 2,300 employees. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the Hoosier State, you guys are extremely charitable. You are a very giving firm. Help us get to know you guys a little bit better. Where are you spending your time and how do you give back to the community? Johnny loved the kids, <laughs> is what I'm going to say. Um, I got involved back, I mean, I'm a big brother. Um, I was told by my dad that we need more positive male role models. And hope, I'm not perfect, but hopefully, you know, I can have people learn from my mistakes. You know, I love basketball, play basketball. It allows barriers to be broken down because you have a commonality or people think I'm cooler than I am because I've got jerseys on the wall and things like that. Um, so I'm a big brother. I also believe in entrepreneurship, um, being a business owner, having an asset, especially something that you can pass down. So I serve on the board of Ivy Tech's um, entrepreneur program. Um, but I also love the institutions, again, that I said that have shaped me. Um, so I'm on boards of my high school and also college. Um, of course, we do a lot of things at J.P. Morgan Chase. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very fortunate to, you know, work with Aaron on a market leadership team, allowing us to give back in ways that are meaningful for us to be in the community and organizations that might not be shiny, that everyone doesn't know about, but are making a huge impact on the community. Mm -hmm. Having those grassroots and feet on the ground and the normal things that we do, yeah. when we see that someone needs help, we know that we've got the backing of a phenomenal organization and who to go to and say, hey, we want to help them. I love that. Do you want to share some of your community? Yeah, sure. So I actually started volunteering for Junior Achievement, uh, I would say, 15 years ago um, in JA and a day, which used to be more of like a week long where you'd yeah. go in. Um, and I really became passionate about that organization. And uh, about nine years ago, joined the volunteer leadership group that we have locally um, in at uh, JP Morgan. And we do JA and a day, Job Spark. Um, BizTown. So all my, two of my three kids have been through BizTown through their school, but then we partner with George Fisher at school, um, IPS 93. So we've done a lot with them. So now I serve on the board and also investment committee uh, for junior achievement. And then I've been really part of, you know, the business resource groups that we have within. So I was co-chair of Women on the Move, uh, which is a really large, uh, one of the largest uh, business resource groups and one of the oldest, which is fantastic. And then we have, you know, so many others. Shout um, out to Next Gen. Yeah. <laughs> 
young professionals. <laughs> the young prof I don't qualify anymore. And then we have, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also co-chair of the market leadership team. So, you know, when you talk about that, I know you're going to talk to uh, Mambu later, but, you know, his he has 1.6 that he gives annually, you know, just to Indiana. We don't do a good enough job, I think, always telling our story and what we're doing locally. And then between our market leadership team and our, um, we it's about 400,000. So we try to pick, you know, institutions that fit within, you know, our four pillars. And I would say we're very passionate about making sure. I mean, we hear a lot of times, oh, you're a large institution. You're a New York bank. Well, yes, but we're also local. We have 23 employees. We give this money back to the community in which we live and work. And so, you know, we always like to share that story because it's local personal relationships that we're after. I love that you guys are giving back. Um, you guys are engaged. Chase is engaged. Let's close out. How do we get other people engaged and get them involved with Chase and all the things that you guys have to offer? I'll close this one last stat. Um, there's a recent survey with city certified black businesses that over 80% of them reported that they've never received a, known, a loan for their business. Mm. And further studies show that um, black businesses, only 1% of them even sought out a loan in their first year of their business. There's a huge gap there of getting people to come to the bank and get engaged um, with it, whether it's their personal finances or growing their business. As you guys think about where you guys are investing your time and money, um, help me, John, understand why is this important for you to work for an organization that's really bringing all this inclusivity? An example of one of the reasons why I'm so passionate and I love drinking the Kool-Aid of J.P. Morgan Chase is, you know, kind of what Aaron said is a lot of times we hear we're a huge bank. Um, we try to make this large corporation community based. Mm -hmm. And as an example of I was new to the firm and I was at an event that I knew would be perfect and aligned with our four pillars. Took a picture of the presenting sponsors and say, hey, we can make such a huge impact on this. And in a very short amount of time, because of the resources that we have, you can see an immediate impact of getting involved and actually taking that organization to the next level in order for them to spread their wings out and to touch more people. When that happens once, and you know that it can continue to happen and we are encouraged to get my team involved and they know to go through me and they know that I'm gonna to go to somebody else in order to touch the communities that they're in. How do you not just take advantage of that? How do you not just use that as motivation to get out there? I love that. Do you want to share why you're inspired to stay at Chase? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think about when I started in 01, and it's always been, it's interesting when I talk to, you know, some people at different institutions. I just, it's really in our DNA, and it's kind of like we're, we're talking about, you know, what we've announced, but it's just, you know, from our CEO down, like we live it every day. Um, it's not something that we just talk about. We literally put action from every line of business. Um, we have a morning call every morning in the private bank and it's really, you know, it's very timely updates. And But when things are happening in the world, as they always are, we have employees on that are telling their story and, you know, bringing awareness to different things. And, you know, I think about, I just, you know, hired someone and she just said, I feel like I can bring my authentic real self to work. And that was, you know, that to me means that we're doing what, you know, the right things. And so that, that meant a lot. And that's why I'm always so proud to say where I work. The person that brought me in tells me that all the time. This is a place where you can bring your authentic self. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if he meant my Jordans and I don't know if he meant blinging back the CZs that I had <laughs> back when I was in college and things like that. But what's important to me, what's important yeah. to what I would say my people and my family and being supported, yep. it's not just lip service. I love that. You guys are putting action behind the words that you guys said that you want to do. I can feel the passion from both of you. It seems like you have great stories and really cool jobs. You get to work with people um, mm -hmm. and learn about things to make them grow. I'll give you guys the closing words. Are there some call to actions or things that you want people to do so that they can feel more engaged with you or people on your team? 
ladies first? Yeah, no, I mean, I would say I know they're going to have our contact information. So if that's the best way um, to reach out to us instead of, you know, they can always go onto the Chase website if they want to make like an appointment. But I know both John and I would love to, you know, help people make that introduction for a relationship. But I would just say, like, I just want to make sure that people form that relationship with your local branch, with ourselves. Um, we want to be as accessible as possible. I think the easiest thing is I could say is to go to the website. Um, you can go to the website and you can actually schedule a meeting with one of our bankers mm -hmm. or actually one of our financial advisors no more than three weeks out. But Aaron and I talked and I apologize if I'm going to talk for you. Yeah. Just hit us no, up. No, that's what I, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like we want to mm -hmm. be the conduit and make it as simple as possible. By hitting us up, we can get you in front of the right people depending on where you live, what you're looking for. Yep. I know that both of us are so passionate about this. Of, I'm a control freak when it comes to this. I trust but verify. Mm -hmm. You can hold me accountable. Um, but let us be the beginning of the relationship, and then hopefully we can just build on that. Mm -hmm. But Chase.com. And you also want to invite them to come into the bank, right? No, absolutely. Would be remiss if we didn't say that. Yeah. Um, walk into your local br branch. You can tell them that we sent you mm -hmm. and then they can blame it on us. But we want to meet people where they are, Perfect. not talking above you, not making you feel like you don't know. I think one of the biggest things that my team enjoys is helping people from the foundation. You know, one of the reasons why I got into this business is my dad would drag me around to open houses and retirement parties and things like that because he didn't want to pay for a babysitter. And people were thanking him for doing things they didn't want back in the day to get them to where they are. And when I saw that excitement and how he didn't have to pull it out of them, they just yep. wanted to thank him for that. I was like, man, I can do that. I want to do that. Like that is, you know, the impact. So put it on us. We'll get you out there. I love it. I want to thank you, Aaron and John, for joining this conversation today. We heard a lot of great tips, um, not only from wealth building, but also how do you get into the bank and make it much smaller? We are talking to a very large bank, but I love um, at least from the outside looking in, you guys are making a very large bank feel much smaller and much more personable. So we are starting the conversation here, but I engage and invite all of you guys to come in and let's continue this conversation throughout the week.